Praise the Lord. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, to have the privilege of being in his presence. Hallelujah. Would you open your Bibles up this morning to the book of James, um, the first chapter. I want to direct your attention to verses uh, 5 through 8, James 1, verses 5 through 8. Here's what the word of the Lord says. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. God's not a tightwad. He's a liberal God. Not liberal morality, but liberal in his giving. Amen? If any man, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. What does it mean to upbraid? Do you have any idea? To rebuke, to chastise. Uh, he's not going to rebuke you for asking. He's not going to say, how come you're bugging me? But he gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Listen to this. For let not that man, what man? The man that is wavering. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I want you to think about it. A double-minded person is a person that's of two minds. Uh, to illustrate what I'm saying, you can be seated. Uh, <clears throat> while my wife and I were traveling as evangelists we, we traveled for seven and a half years preaching the gospel from coast to coast we went to Cal from California to North Carolina and back two times uh, over those years preached the word of the Lord and uh, one day I heard my, my daughter at the time she was uh, four or five years old I don't remember just how old but she was a very small child and uh, she often played church. She baptized her baby dolls in Jesus' name. Uh, she shouted. We have a cassette tape when we were preaching a revival in Los Angeles. Uh, one year, we were, they put us up in a motel. And uh, my little daughter, she, Nancy, she was uh, praying and worshiping God. And uh, my wife turned on the recorder, and you could hear little patent leather shoes on the tile floor, she was in there shouting. You could hear him clicking on the floor. Click, 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 click. She was shouting. Uh, and one day I heard her in there. She was kind of praying. I don't know what to go on, but she would say, oh, yes, I will. Oh, no, I won't. Oh, yes, I will. Oh, no, I won't. Double-minded. Oh, yes, I will. Oh, no, I won't. Now, she was a child, and I thought that was kind of funny. But, you know, it's amazing how many apostolics are of two minds two minds. I'm preaching this morning, teaching this morning on the subject of developing steadfast faith. The Bible says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that is very critical when it comes to faith. We can't be of two minds. One day believe God's going to do it and the next day doubt that he will. One day know he's hearing us and the next day say, God, you forgot me. And I, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I know that a lot of apostolics suffer from that affliction. Amen. Oh, Sister Gloria, you wanted to testify. Right now, real quick, because i got just a few minutes and i got to use them all up. I just want to tell you, last Sunday or the Sunday before, that evening when Pastor um, Allred spoke the word, he was telling his testimony, but to make a long story short, God healed me of my hip. I have no pain whatsoever. I have to take no aspirins, and I praise God for it. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is wonderful. Hallelujah. Jesus is wonderful. So faith is like a muscle. Um, 
Faith is like a muscle. Uh, the only way it can get larger is to exercise it. Now, uh, because I'm because I'm on Social Security, I got a, I'm told I have a, a a membership to a gym around here somewhere called uh, Silver Sneakers. I guess because we got silver hair, but I haven't found the place that lets me come in there just yet for free. But I'll find it. Uh, but anyway, you don't go to the gym and go over there where those barbells are, you know, when they got them stacked up on a rack and big. You don't go over there and put 300 pounds on it and lay down on the bench press and you're going to pin, you're going to say, I'm going to bench press 300 pounds when you can't even lift 50. You don't start out lift, trying to lift 300 pounds. You start off with lesser. Why? And you, by repetition, pretty soon you will be lifting that 300 pounds. Uh, and so what scares me about, uh, and I, I don't get afraid of very many things. I, I don't, I'm afraid of snakes, and I don't like heights. It's kind of strange that I'm a roofer by trade, and I don't like heights. But nevertheless, uh, um, I'm not afraid of too many things. But what scares me when we start talking about faith and believing God for healing is there are those people that immediately... They want to practice on their children. And they want to, well, I'm trusting God to heal my child of this, so they take away all medications. And you've, you know what I'm talking about? And you've heard those stupid, those, the reproach that happens in the news. This family are being prosecuted for abusive children because they took the medication away from the child and the child died. Oh, we were trusting God. That gives a black eye to faith. How about you start trusting God for yourself? Right. That's it. Practice on yourself. But you must start with small things. Don't wait till you get that diagnosis from the doctor. You got stage four cancer and said, oh, I'm going to trust God. You, your faith won't be up to it. Are you with me? We start with when you got the headache or the toothache. You start with you got your, your back's aching. You got a cold. Your nose is running. You start trusting God and, and believing him to heal you. And when he does, you praise him. Remember David, when he went to face Goliath, what did he say to Saul? Saul said, you're but a youth, and he's been a warrior from his youth. And David said, when I tended my father's flock, a bear came out. Now, I've got a 600-pound bear in my garage, and every time I look at that, I think about David. David said, a bear came and grabbed one of the sheep out of my flock, and he said, I went and took that lamb out of his mouth. And then he said, I killed that bear. He didn't have a 357 Magnum. He didn't have a 44 Magnum. He didn't have a rifle. He just took him with his hands. And he said, a lion came. Now, that's a little bigger, isn't it? Not a mountain lion, a lion. And that lion came and took that lamb, and he said, I, I rent him. He grabbed him by his chin whiskers and his mane. He said, I ripped him open, and I took that lamb out of his mouth. And I said, he said, I got his hides. The lion and the bear, their hide is hanging on the shed, Fred. And then David said, this uncircumcised Philistine is going to be just like that bear and just like that lion. God delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me out of this. What does that show you? It shows you the accumulation of faith, the development of a steadfast faith. How strong was David's faith, Brother Arnie, when the, when the giant said, you little squirt, I mean more or less, I'm terrible, you little squirt, you're coming after me with a, with a stick? What am I, a dog? He said, I'm going to take your flesh and I'm going to it, feed it to the birds. You know, he's talking a little smack. 
And David just turned back with a steadfast faith, and he said, you come to me with the sword and the spear, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel that you've defied. And he said, I'm, go I'm going to cut your head off, and I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds. And then the Bible said there was no sword in David's hand. Now, how are you going to cut somebody's head off if you ain't got no sword? But that steadfast faith that David had, he said, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. And, of course, the first guided missile, laser sights, pow! He slung that stone and hit him in the forehead, knocked him out, went over and drew his own sword and cut his head off with his own sword. What gave him that steadfast faith in God? That lion and the bear back there in the background. And so we start believing God for small things. And the Bible says if you're faithful in a little bit, you'll be faithful in a lot. The Bible said he that is unfaithful in small things will be unfaithful in big things. Boy, I can really preach this. Well, the Lord woke me up at 1.30 this morning and dropped this in my heart. And I, I'm telling you what, when that happens, I know I'm on track. Because I sleep like a rock. It may take me a while to get to sleep, but when I get to sleep, buddy, I'm out. I mean, 1.30 this morning, the Lord woke me up, and these scriptures were on my mind. And I, I know where we're going today. Praise God. Uh, my daughter, uh, she's old now. She's in her 40s. But uh, when she was a child, I taught her the scriptures. And uh, I taught her that Jesus was her healer. So when she had a an owie or a hurt or whatever, the first words out of her mouth were, Daddy, pray for me. The first words out of her mouth. She never said, Daddy, take me to the doctor. Daddy, pray for me. Um, we were preaching revival in Clovis, California. It's a home missionary church. Um, how home, home missionary was it? Well, my wife and I stayed and slept in the Sunday school room, and we slept on a twin bed. Okay. In that revival, a lady brought her children to church one night, and uh, she came up for prayer, and she brought them up to the front, and she said, would you pray for our children, my, my kids? Now, I don't know how anybody else does it. I don't know if the way I do it's right or not, just, just how I do it. So what I said, what's wrong with your kids? And the lady said, they have the chicken pox. And I looked at them, and they were broke out with chicken pox. All you medical people out here, you know that there's any, you know they're contagious for about two weeks, particularly while the blisters are running, right? Here they were. And I thought, oh, my God. My first thought was, my daughter's been playing with these kids in church. And here we are, evangelists. We're going to be traveling to another church, and after that, another church, and after, and we're going to be spreading chicken pox everywhere we go. <laughs> so we prayed for the lady's children, Pastor and I, and the Lord healed them. They never missed a night of revival. There was no more chicken pox. They were gone. God healed them. I, somebody, the pastor, or somebody touched God. All right, And so I begin to pray and said, now look, God, we're doing your work here. We're traveling. We're staying in people's homes. We're going to be here two weeks, there two weeks. Somebody, the incubation period is two weeks, and we can't spread chicken pox all over the Western District. Nobody will want us to have a revival. We're spreading chicken pox. And, and I, I prayed like I said, now look, I don't care. God, I'm asking you, while we're evangelizing, I want you to rebuke this chicken pox virus from my daughter. When we settle down somewhere in pastor, she can have the chicken pox. I want her to have the chicken pox. I want her to develop an immunity to that stuff. And so, but well, while we're evangelizing, I'm asking you to rebuke this chicken pox virus from my daughter. And I would hear my daughter saying to little kids, she'd say, I'm not going to get the chicken pox because my dad's done rebuke the devil. Only she didn't say rebuke. She said beruked. <laughs> He's done beruked the devil. My daughter did not get the chicken pox till we settled down in Burbank, California to pastor in 1981. 
She was in the third grade, and she got the chicken pox. She had about ten chicken pox, and that was it. But what are you saying? Are you bragging on yourself? No, it's not me. It's God. I expected completely, absolutely, that God would rebuke the chicken pox virus, and she would not have the chicken pox, and she didn't have the chicken pox. That seven and a half years that we traveled, no more. And so developing a steadfast faith. We preached last week, Psalm 138.3. He has magnified his word above all of his name. And so we're talking about it today. James said, if any man lack wisdom, what is wisdom? There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is information. Now, there's a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom. I'm not necessarily talking about that. Those are gifts of the Spirit. But on its, the etymology of the word wisdom, has to re, it relates back to knowledge. You can have knowledge about something, but if you don't know how to use that knowledge, you're shot down. And so what wisdom is, is how to use the knowledge that you have. And so James says, if you lack, if any man, any person lacks wisdom, they don't know what to do with the knowledge they have, let him ask of God that gives to all men, not just males, but all of humanity, liberally, and upbraids not. He's not going to chide you and and rebuke you for asking, he's going to give to you wisdom. You lack it, ask him for it. He'll give it to you liberally. But notice what he says here. Notice the positive. If any uh, man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to liberal, giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. And it shall be given him. Not it can be, or it could be, or he's able to give it. It shall be given him. Positive? Positive? Shall be given him? All right. Well, what's the key? But let him ask in faith. Now, remember we taught last week, Romans 12, 3, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Raise your hand and say, I got the measure of faith. You need to claim it. You need to acknowledge it. Amen. He has dealt to you the measure of faith. And so he says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. That is, it's not, oh, yes, I will. Oh, no, I won't. No. Oh, yes, he will. Oh, yes, he is. I receive it from you right now. Now, Brother Fisher will tell you how many times in pastoring and counseling, with people over the years, how many times have we heard something we didn't know what to do about it? A lot of times. Now, we don't tell you that. It's not that we know that we have all the answers, because we sometimes don't even know the questions. But here's what we do know. That God will give me the word that I need right when I need it. And it blows my mind. One of the I don't necessarily like counseling with people. I'm glad I'm not a pastor. I'm not I'm a uh, I'm a retired pastor, so I don't have to do much of that anymore. Hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. But what I did like it and did joy about it was, brother, uh, is when to sit there with a question in my heart saying, Oh my God, what am I gonna do now? And the Lord speak right to me and tell me what to say. And I said, This is what you do. And go home and say, I can't believe God told me that. Where'd that come from? It came from the Lord. And to watch the situation be taken care of. That is the most amazing thing. That God would give us wisdom when we need it. Amen. And so he said, it shall be given him. Uh, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Why? For he that wavereth. That means off and on, yes and no. Today he will, tomorrow I don't know. Get rid of that. Nothing wavering. Why? Because he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, 
driven with the wind and tossed. And it says, let not that man, the person that wavers, think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. What's he saying? If we waver, one day we believe, one day we don't. One day we're sure, the next day we're not sure. You're not going to get anything from God because you're double-minded. It's not mind over matter. It's the word over all other things. I want to know what God says. And once I find out what God says, then I want to forget everything else man says. Amen. A good friend of ours, she lives in Lompoc, California. Her name is Cindy. She's a RN. She's a registered nurse. Um, Brother Kendrick was her pastor. But he's gone on to be with the Lord now. But she had severe diabetes. Um, she had to inject herself regularly with insulin. She had been prayed for many times that God would heal her. And healing had not come to her. But one Sunday morning, Sister Cindy approached Brother Kendrick and she said, Today is the day for me to be healed. Would you pray for me? And he laid hands on her and prayed for her that God would heal her of her diabetes. She didn't quit taking her medicine. She continued to, to, to inject with insulin. But she knew in her heart that that day was the day for her to be healed. And she, continued, she thanked God for it. She thanked Pastor, God's touched me. I'm going to be all right. But she got sick. So she went to the doctor. The doctor did a test and said, Cindy, are you taking insulin? She says, yes. She says, you have no, you, you've got too much insulin in your body. It is making you sick. Do not take any more insulin. And from that day to this, no diabetes, no insulin. But she reached a place where she knew in her heart that God had healed her. And from that point on, she praised God, and the doctors confirmed that God had healed her. Amen? And we got a lot of medical people here in this church, and we're not against medical people. We're not against doctors. We're not critical of them. They do so many good things. There are people that their lives are so much better because of People have dedicated their life to study in medicine, so forth and so on. So we're not going to be critical. We're not going to condemn anybody that goes to the doctor. But what are we trying to do? Develop a steadfast faith that first go to God, and God will take care of it. And save you money in the long run. Hallelujah. Yeah. How many's ever had the flu and gone to the doctor? They charge you $70 to go in there. You know what they tell you? I'll tell you what the doctor's going to say. So we can't prescribe any antibiotics because antibiotics don't work on viruses. Get plenty of rest and drink plenty of water. Thank you for the $70. That just burns me up. I could. And so developing a steadfast faith. According as God has dealt to every, you got the faith this morning. He gave it to you. It's a gift from God. And so what we, I'm working on this morning is we need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We talked about that last week. So I've got to move along. The word of God is seed. You would mock a farmer if he, had, he said to you, I'm going to have a bumper crop. I'm thanking God for a bumper crop. He hasn't plowed the field. He hasn't planted any seed. And he said, I'm going to have a bumper crop of, of wheat this year and he hadn't planted any seed, you'd say, you're stupid. You'd say, you're ignorant. You can't have a crop if you don't plant it. But you know what the farmer can say? I've cultivated the field. I've planted the seed in there. I'm, gonna ha I'm thanking God right now for a good crop this year. But he don't go around every day digging it up to see if it's germinating. What does he do? He waters it, he cultivates it, whatever you do, right? And one day he harvests a crop. We don't have to go around digging it up. Do I have faith? We need to thank God he's dealt us the measure of faith. And say, God, you, and my faith is not based on what grandma said. My faith is based on what God said. And so if we're going to have 
uh, if we're going to have a steadfast faith, we've got to uh, we got to do this for healing. We must rid ourselves of all uncertainties as to whether it is the will of God for us to be healed. This gets hits a nerve in apostolic circles. I'm telling you, it hits a nerve when you start talking about is it the will of God for everybody to be healed. I traveled around this country. I've talked to enough preachers. I know it's a nerve, buddy. I know it's a nerve. And so I set out on a quest, not, not trying to gain any reputation. I just want to know what God's Word said. I've read, since I've been here in Gallup, I've read the New Testament through three times. I'm on my fourth time now. And I've been searching for one thing. Any indicator that I could find in the will of God in the word of God that I needed to pray if it was the will of God for me to be healed I'm going to tell you I haven't found it there's no teaching that I should pray whether it's the will of God for me to be healed or not or for you to be healed it's to be understood it is the will of God why? when you think of Jesus the Bible says with his stripes ye are healed do you think Jesus ha endured all of that so that we would have to pray? Now, Lord, if you get around to it, if you think I ought to, or if you think you could, or you could heal me, no. He endured the contradiction of sinners so that we could come to him with confidence. He's telling you, it is my will to heal you. One of his names of redemption in the Old Testament, you can find it in, uh, in Exodus, the 15th chapter, in the 26th verse. You find his name. He said, I am the Lord that healeth all thy diseases. Not some of them, but all of them. Now, we talk about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. When you need, you know, how many's ever prayed that? Lord, you said, the New Testament, Paul said, Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. We shout over that. Amen? Well, he's also Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth. We need to shout over that. Hallelujah. It's Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we, have a, so we need to rid ourselves of all uncertainty concerning whether it's the will of God for us to be healed. When we read in the... And I'm going to give you some homework. Would you like some homework? I dub, I'll just be, use a little bit of human reason. I double dog dare you to read the book of Matthew. I've done this since I've been here. I went through the book of Matthew. And I why? Because I want to talk, I want to meet Jesus. You're going to meet Jesus in the Gospels. You're going to walk and talk with Jesus in the gospel. You're going to hear what he said, how he did it, so forth, so on. If you will read the book of Matthew, here's what you're going to and get your pencil out. Pen, write in your Bible. I write in my Bible. You can underline. Now, some people just underline everything. Pretty soon they don't, it doesn't mean a thing because every pay every line's underlined. Don't do that. But on a key important like this subject, here's what you're going to find as you read through Matthew and you, where you talks about Jesus healing, okay? You're going to find, I can't tell you how many times I didn't count them, but I, I'm going to tell you, it's in there a multiplicity of times. And it says, and Jesus went to theirs. So he was in Peter's mother-in-law's house and he prayed for her and he raised her up. She had a fever and she went immediately went and cooked dinner for him. And it says, they brought unto him many that were sick and afflicted and were possessed of devils. And he did what? He healed them all. Not some of them, all of them. And that phrase is repeated, I would safely say, 20 times in the book of Matthew when it talks about Jesus meeting people that were sick. It said, he healed them all. There's only two places that I've found in the book of Matthew. One of them was Jesus went to his hometown, Nazareth. And they said to him, do the mighty works here in Nazareth that you did in Capernaum. But it said Jesus did not do many wonderful works in Nazareth, except he laid his hands on a few people that were sick and he healed them. But he did not many wonderful works in Nazareth because of their unbelief. 
And wh- how do we know? Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary? And isn't this his brothers and sisters over here? Who does this guy think he is anyway? Is basically what they're saying. And the other time was when Jesus passed by the pool of Bethesda in John 2, I think it is. There was a man that had an infirmity 38 years. And the Bible says Jesus knew he had been a long time in that condition. And he said to the man, read it. I'm, I want you to look. Don't do it now. Just look, read it. He said to the man that had been afflicted for 38 years, he said, will thou be made whole? He didn't say, do you want to be? Will you? Different. And this man said, he started whining and sniveling. The pool of Bethesda, at a certain time, an angel came and troubled the water, and whosoever first stepped in the pool was healed. And the man, Jesus says, wilt thou be made whole? Been there 38 years. And he said to Jesus, every time I try to get in the pool, Somebody gets in ahead of me, and I don't have anybody to help me. Read it, if it ain't so. Whining and sniveling, and nobody's prayed the prayer of faith for me. Nobody helped me. Nobody loves me. Um, everybody hates me. I'm going to go in the backyard and eat worms. What did Jesus say to that? Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And he got up and packed his bag and walked. Hello? So, Nazareth, no many miracles were done there, not because Jesus wasn't able to do it, but because of their unbelief. You'll also find in the book of Matthew, you'll find different individuals, that when Jesus spoke to them, he said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. What was it? The woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, suffered many things of many physicians, steadily grew worse. She got up one morning and she heard about Jesus coming to town. And what did she say? Well, I know he's able. I know he can. I hope he will. No. I know that if I but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. And then she went, Brother White, and she got through the press. It wasn't the news people. It was a throng of people around Jesus. She made her way in, Brother brother Dominic, and she got down, and she touched the hem of his garment. And the Bible says she knew in her heart that she was healed. And not only did she know, Jesus said, Who touched me? And the disciples begin to rebuke Jesus. They said, Lord, look at this crowd. They're all wanting to get close to you. And you're saying, who touched me? And Jesus said, I felt virtue go out of my body. And the woman said, it was me. And what did Jesus say to the lady? Thy faith hath made. What did he say to some other people? He said, be it unto you, even as your faith. Hello? The man that was a centurion that came to Jesus and he said, my servant is sick unto death. Will you come and heal him? And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And the man said, wait a minute. I'm a man under authority. A centurion was a man that had a hundred soldiers under his command. And he said, I'm a man of authority. I say to this man, go, and he goes. I say, you come here, and he comes here. And he said, Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. You just speak the word, and my servant will be healed. And the Lord said, I have not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. And he said, your servant is well. And the man went home, and he checked it out. And at that same hour that he was talking with Jesus, the child, the servant began to be healed. And so what we've got to do, saints of God, is Jesus purchased our healing. We're not going to preach against doctors. We're not going to say people are sinning if they go to the doctor. No, 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 no. Get rid of that Tommy Rod. That's craziness. Let's get our mind on the subject is that Jesus is the healer. 
Let's get our mind off the subject. I gotta, I'm not holy enough. And it's not about holiness in that matter. It's about a trust in God. It's about a steadfast faith. It's about an assurance that our God loves us and cares for us. Our God is moved with compassion. He can feel our needs. And he's ready to meet those needs. And so we got to get rid of that. We need to be sure when we start to exercise, attempt to exercise faith for healing, we need to know what the scriptures say about it. That's why I want you to read Matthew. Read it. You're going to find out several, many times, he said he healed them all. Now listen, the Bible says this. Let's look at Romans, the fourth chapter. Oh no, tenth chapter. Got to hurry here. Romans 10, uh, starting with verse number 14. Uh, some people call this the Roman road. It's the wrong place to go to tell people how to be saved. It's not talking about that. Let's but see what it is talking about. Romans 10, 14 says this. And how then shall they uh, call on him of whom they have not heard? Not believe, excuse me. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall he pr they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them. Uh, hallelujah, that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Right. Hallelujah. What happens is we've got to preach and teach about, you get what you preach, preachers. If you preach the devil, you get the devil. You preach Jesus, you get Jesus. And everything he has to say. I don't want to hear about the devil. I want to hear about Jesus. Do you know why people receive the Holy Ghost in apostolic churches? Why aren't they receiving it at the first church of Christ? At the first church of Christ, they say, God doesn't do it anymore. And if you start... Speaking in tongues, they said, that's of the devil. They're ready to bounce you right out of the door. Why do people receive the Holy Ghost here, Brother Fisher? Because we preach not only that it's for you, you must have the Holy Ghost in order to be saved. And people come here and they receive the Holy Ghost. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You could go to charismatic churches in town and some of them are receiving the Holy Ghost. Why doesn't all of their members have the Holy Ghost? Because they don't believe it's for everybody. Their, their idea about the scriptures is that some can and some can't and you don't need it to go to heaven. It's just in the, you know, it's a spare tire in the trunk. If you get dull, your law for God gets dull asking for the Holy Ghost. No. You must be born again of water and spirit. And we preach the Holy Ghost is for everybody. And we teach that the Holy Ghost is for everybody. When they come to the altar, Brother Arnie, what do we do? Come on, stand up. I need you. You're a good man. I love you. I watch him. He goes around and prays for people. This man has faith. What are we doing when we're somebody down here at the altar, Brother, Brother Arnie? What are we doing when they come, they got their hands up in the air, or they're down there at the altar? What do we say to them? I said, God wants you to have the Holy Ghost. What you're feeling is the Holy Ghost. Right? If you ask God, He'll give you the Holy Ghost. We're going to lay hands on you and pray for you that God will give you the Holy Ghost. Are we surprised when they get the Holy Ghost? No! Why? God's eternal word says he will give the Holy Spirit to everyone that asks him. You get what you preach. And so there's a need in among apostolics to preach about healing. But let's don't get hung up on the deal where well, we got to pray and see if it's God's will. Look at Calvary. Look at the, in the judgment hall. The stripes lean on his back. Uh, for he, with his stripes we are healed. It ain't about right. It might not happen. It is the will of God. And so if we're going to have exercise, we're going to have a steadfast faith, we're going to have to get our nose in that Bible. And we're going to have to find out what God said about it. And when you find out what God said about it, you grab a hold on to it. 
And when you pray, you pray the word of God. I'm not, I'm not, there's a little glitch. I'm feeling a glitch right now. In New Converts class, when I taught it in, in Ventura, I wanted to teach, I'd rather teach New Converts class than Sunday morning adult class. One of the memory verses we had, I made a memorized verses. And they had to stand up and quote them every week. I signed them one every week. They had to do it. To be a member in the church, they had to go through that new converts class. And they had to memorize those verses. You say, Brother Alden. Yeah, that's how I did it. Anyway, one of the memory verses on prayer is this. Philippians 4, 5, and 6. Be careful for nothing. The word careful means do not worry about anything. If you've got a study Bible, it'll say do not be anxious. That's to be worried. Be careful for, now, all of us in here have been worried, haven't we? If you're worrying right now, let me tell you something. Worry is unbelief. Worry is unbelief. It is unbelief. So, be careful for nothing. Well, how can we be free from worry? Take Xanax? God forbid. How can we be free from... Take a tranquilizer. No! Be careful for nothing. How can we live like that? Every, worry is everybody has battles with it. Just say yes, it's true. But how can I win the victory over that? Be careful for nothing, but in everything. Not some things. Everything. By what? Prayer. And supplications. Now, what's supplication? That's a degree in prayer. Praying is talking to God, but supplication is intense passion. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Why did he say pray and have supplication and then put in uh, thanksgiving? Because thanksgiving is faith. I've prayed about it. I've cried about it, and I thank you for it. Let your request be made known to God. What happens? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts, that's your emotion, and your mind through Christ Jesus. Heart, mind, prayer. Supplication. 1973, when my wife, and when I was getting, the Lord spoke to me in 1973. I know that's before some of you folks were born, but still the Word of God anyway. I was assistant pastor in Ventura. I've been there two years, and it, the Lord spoke to me. It's time for me to go back evangelizing. I talked to the pastor, Brother Barkley, and I said, it's the will of God for me to go back evangelizing. He didn't want me to go evangelize. He wanted me to stay there and assist him, and uh, he wanted me to start a church and I told him, I'm going to go, it's time for me to go evangelize. And he said, why don't you go to Carpenteria and start a church? I said, I don't want to go to Carpenteria and start a church. The Lord don't want me to go there. He wants me to go evangelize. What about Camarillo? I'm not going to Camarillo. I'm going to go evangelizing. It's the will of God. So I gave it a job. I, I had a job. I uh, went to my boss, and I said, in two weeks, I'm quitting. Why are you quitting? I'm going evangelizing. Gave my two weeks notice. I went to, uh, I, I knew I needed a pickup truck because I wanted to buy a trailer and I needed a truck to pull it. But I didn't have any money. I sold everything I had. I was working for $4.89 an hour. Not much money, even in 73. And so I went, I sold whatever I had to accumulate some money to, to put down on a truck, which was not much. I went to the Chevrolet dealer and I said, I want to lease a truck. And they said, okay, give them the information. They said, come back Friday and pick up your truck. I said, okay. Got off work Friday, got the pastor, because uh, he was smart about signing contracts and stuff. I took Brother Barkley with me. We went into the Chevrolet dealer. The dealer, the, the salesperson met me at the door and said, Mr. Allred, we're not going to be able to lease your truck unless you can come up with some more money. I didn't have any money. 
I went out of that dealership heartbroken. I'd already given my two weeks notice and a week had already gone up. I got to church on Friday night and the pastor called me aside and said, um, Brother Gentles over in Orange Cove uh, just called me today. I said, oh yeah, that's my cousin. I'm going to preach my first revival for him. He said, oh, no, you're not. He canceled me. And Brother Barkley said, are you sure it's the will of God for you to go evangelize? No truck. First revival canceled. My own cousin. You talk about a one-two punch, one in the gut, one in the chin. I took it right then. Pop, pop. I'm just kind of. Church started, and I went to the basement. My wife was sitting on the back row of the church on the right-hand side. I went down to that basement. They were having church and singing and worshiping and shouting God, shouting and praising God. I went over into a corner, and I got down on my knees, and I began to pray. And I said, now, God, you told me to go evangelize. You said it was time, and I believe you. You know that the truck deal fell through. You know that my cousin canceled me, my own cousin. I don't even have a revival to go to, and I got one week's work left, and that's it. Now, God, I'm not leaving here till you talk to me. And I began to pray and cry out to God and speak to God and waited on God. And pretty soon, that worry and that fear went away. There came right here in my gut an assurance. The peace of God came. Now, if you've never wrestled it through, you do not know what I'm talking about. But if you have, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I remember when that peace of God came upon me, I quit praying. I jumped up. I ran up the stairs out of the basement. I ran into the auditorium. They're singing and shouting. I didn't care what was going on. I ran down the center aisle of church. My wife was sitting on, well, you're not my wife, but let's play. She's sitting on the back row. And I went up to her and I grabbed her by the hand and I said, you're not my wife, I'm sure. I said, honey, everything's going to be all right. Did I, sister, all right? Say it yes loud. Don't bob your head. Say yes. He didn't tell me how it was going to be all right, Brother Fisher, but he told me it was going to be all right. Man, I rejoiced. I went to work Monday morning. I went by the time clock. I punched in. And this guy, I had my tool pouch with all my hammers and all that stuff. I'm walking towards my workstation, thanking God for his goodness, and a man by the name of Oscar Santiago. He was in charge of the roof department that built the roofs for the the roof structures for the mobile homes that I worked on. I knew who the man was, but he was not a friend of mine. I just knew him as an acquaintance. And that man walked up to me, Brother Boss, and he called me by my first name. He says, Larry, I hear that you want to buy a truck. I hadn't told anybody at that place I wanted to buy a truck. And he said, I hear you want to buy a truck. And I said, I do, but I don't have any money. He said, I've got a truck. And he said, I like your car. (laughs) Now, it was a Dodge Coronet. I still owed money on it. And he said, I like your car. He said, "Uh, if you give me your car, you can have my truck. Sell it to me. I said, okay. If the bank will finance it. Called my wife up, said, you want to meet meet me at the bank? Went to the bank. Oscar brought his truck. I drove my car. My wife, I believe my wife met me at the bank. I went into the banker. His name is Mr. Thedford. It was Crocker National Bank. It's not anymore. There's no more Crocker National Bank. I said, Mr. Thedford, I want to buy this truck. He said, let's look at it. He looked at it. And I said, but I want to, he wants my car. I want to give him my car. I want to buy his truck. And I owed money on the car. And as we walked back into the bank, Mr. Thedford went out there and he looked around that truck. He pulled me off to the side. He said, preacher, you are stealing this truck. 
I said, what do you mean? It was in 1973. This was in April of 1973. It was in 1973 Chevrolet Deluxe Custom truck. Not the Silverado, but the Deluxe Custom one right under it. It had a camper shell on it. The only thing it didn't have was air conditioning. I didn't care it didn't have air conditioning. I need a truck. And I told the Lord, I can't afford more than $100 a month payment for a new truck. How new was the truck? It had 2,900 2, miles on it. And I bought that truck, or God gave it to me, for $2,700. And when I asked, how much is the payment, Mr. Thedford? He said, $104. Now, what am I saying? In prayer that previous Sunday, Friday night, crying and supplicating and praying out to God, telling him my worries and my fears and my anxieties and knowing it was the will of God for me to do what I needed to do, the Lord spoke back to me and told me it's going to be all right. Monday morning, the man says, you want to buy my truck? Give me your car, I'll give you the truck. What are you talking about? The assurance that God will do it. And that comes the same thing with prayer for being healed. We need to know that God says it is so. Now, I'm done. Time, let's stand. I want you to read the verse of Scripture, and we'll close with this. It's in Proverbs, the fourth chapter. i got a bunch more Scriptures, but we don't have time. Proverbs 4, 20 says this. My son, is there anybody here that's the son or a daughter of God? I'm a friend of God. He, I sing that song. I'm a friend of God. He calls me son. That's how I see it. My son, attend unto my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and help to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it proceed are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips. Put them far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. What it's simply saying is put the word of God before your face. What does God say about it? Don't look to the right or to the left. Don't be, oh, yes, I will. Oh, no, I won't. Let's not waver. Let's not stagger. Let's not stumble. Keep it right in front of our face. It is the will of God. And begin to praise Him and worship Him. You will find that your faith grows. That one day you're lifting the 300 pounds. You will find that the answer comes to you. And you will find that He heals you. But we've got to have that steadfast faith. This is what God says. This is what God said he will do. He will do it for me. I'm his son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just like praying for the Holy Ghost. He promised it to me. I'm asking. He's given. I'm receiving. Can you lift up your hands and say, Lord, I want to develop a steadfast faith. I want it to be anchored in your word, in your promise. Hallelujah. You don't change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you're praying for the Holy Ghost, you hit this altar this morning saying, Jesus, you promised it to me. I'm going to go home with it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's begin to worship the Lord.